there's a lot of really fascinating guns out there that I think what, what, what people probably might want to hear from you is maybe some of your favorite gun designs that you've ever looked at uh, in your history. I mean, you probably get this question a lot, I imagine. So can you give just a couple examples of what you personally really enjoy? So to me, the most interesting periods in firearms development are when you have fundamentally new technologies that kind of appear on the scene. And the two that are most relevant for my fairly modern uh, focus are the development of the cartridge, the self-contained metallic cartridge, and sort of, and, and actually it would be the development of smokeless powder because smokeless powder allows reliable self-loading firearms, both semi-automatic and fully automatic. And when that happens, there's sort of like this gold rush of inventors with ideas and how do we how do we make cartridge cases? If you look at, you know, periods around like the, the American Civil War, when the, the metallic cartridge is being adopted, you'll see this really interesting plethora of different designs. You've got, uh, there are some that are still using uh, percussion caps with copper or brass cases that are containing powder. You've got cases that load from the front of the gun, cases that load from the back of the gun. Uh, all sorts of interesting stuff. And what will happen is as inventors come up with ideas, they patent them. And so the most obvious, simple systems often get patented pretty quickly. And then there, there continues to be this big group of inventors who are still looking for, you know, for their ticket into this new technology. And so they'll start kind of widening out into stranger and more complicated ways of doing the same thing so that they can get, they can build something that isn't under patent protection. And as a result of that, you get this all sorts of really funky and unusual designs that often don't work well, um, which makes them perfect fodder for a YouTube channel like mine. You know, oh, they made 300 of these and then everyone went bankrupt because it's a terrible idea. But it, man, it sure looks interesting. Uh, and the same thing happened with self-loading firearms. So in particular, uh, it's, well, it's both the self-loading designs where you get some of the obvious ones early and then you end up with weird, you know, inertially locked things. Uh, and then even better sometimes are the attempts to convert pre-existing manual operation guns into self-loaders. So turning bolt actions into semi-autos. It's a system that has almost never worked. Like there are a few times when they've been successful enough to actually get a few thousand guns produced. Uh, the Australian conversion of the Lien field. Uh, into a light machine gun uh, is one of those examples. But generally speaking, it's it's a few prototypes from a, a hopeful but perhaps naive inventor. And they go nowhere. But man, they're really just really cool to look at. So those sorts of uh, firearms that maybe move the needle uh, in terms of technological development, and then some of the, I guess, wake that's left behind from that new development, those are the ones you find most interesting, the ones that tried to follow this trend and then created these bizarre mechanisms that never really worked, but were fascinating to look at. Is that basically? Yeah, pretty much. A perfect example would be the story of Roland White, who comes up with a pistol, a revolver design uh, that is, it's basically unusable. Um, he patents it, but it doesn't work. And he takes it to Colt and Colt looks at it and goes, I'm not interested in this. I'm not going to buy it. Um, and the key element or what turned out to be the key element in his patent was that he had actually bored the, a hole through the cylinder all the way through. So a typical muzzle loading percussion revolver has a, a chamber in it that's solid at one end, except for a little hole for a percussion cap so that it's sealed. And what Rollin White did is he tried to come up with ammunition that would seal itself, but it wasn't a modern metallic case and it wouldn't have worked. It would have blown out both ends of the cylinder, but he patented, he happened to patent the idea of drilling this hole clear through full diameter through the cylinder. And when Smith and Wesson come up with the first really practical modern metallic cartridge, which is essentially the 22 short, they go to patent it and they discover, oh, Rollin White already has this patent on this specific feature. And so they're able to buy a license from White to use it. And they prevent anyone else uh, from making a revolver that has a cylinder drilled all the way through. And it's a feature that wasn't particularly practical, didn't seem to have any use when Roland White actually patented it. But once the cartridge gets invented, all of a sudden, it, it's a key critical component. 
And Smith and Wesson essentially lock up the revolver market for many years. And that, as a result of that, you get a bunch of other people trying to make metallic cartridge revolvers, and they come up with all sorts of other weird systems. Uh, like I said, some that we, you actually load from the front of the cylinder, somewhere you have a little sliding door on the side of the cylinder, and you like slide it open and put the cartridge in the side and slide it closed. Uh, some of them just straight up violate the patent. Um, and there is, in fact, a series. There are a couple of lawsuits claiming that Colt didn't have uh, didn't have the legal right to have this patent. That there was prior art that should have nullified his patent. And frankly, there was not in the United States, but there were bored through cylinder revolvers that were being made over in Europe before Colt's patent. Um, anyway, it's a fantastic period because of all these weird workarounds that people have to come up with. Well, uh, in this vein, I have a question from one of our members. Uh, which again, by the way, anyone who wants can go and buy a membership today at reload.com. We've got a 20% off sale going on right now. But uh, Brian J asks, can you name any weapon besides something French that failed to become mainstream or popular that you think should have been commercially successful? Oh, the problem is there are very few examples of something that should have been popular, but wasn't. Normally, if it didn't become popular, it was for a pretty good reason. I'm thinking of all the Old West stuff. And you've got, for example, the Evans, which <laughs> sounds like a great idea. It's a lever action rifle that holds 28 or 42 cartridges, depending on the chambering. But it's got a critical flaw that there's no magazine spring. And so you actually, if it's empty, you have to cycle the action 42 times to get the first cartridge from the end of the magazine up to the chamber. Um <laughs> There's the Merwin and Hulbert made by the same company, which is probably the best main, the highest quality revolver of the American Old West era. They're like they're magnificently well made, but they've got some kind of funky attributes to them. Like it, on paper, they sound great. When you open the gun up, it will open up just far enough that it will eject empty cases, but it will retain loaded cartridges. So if you fired three and you want to top the gun off, you pop the thing open and the three empty cases fall out and then you can close it up and you've still got your three live rounds. The problem is you then have to reload the rest of them with a single shot loading gate. So you open it up and then you have to index the cylinder and find the empty chambers and load it that way. And so you kind of lose all the benefit and the exquisite manufacturing made them pretty darn expensive. Um, there are no really good examples of something that sh well, I mean, I think that's interesting in and of itself. So, uh, I mean, especially in perhaps the commercial market, perhaps uh, the uh, sort of evolution of firearms technology has gone in the direction that makes the most sense to this point. Is that a reasonable thing to say? I, I mean, I, I, think I would imagine the there's a number of perhaps military uh, uh, examples where firearms were better suited for their purpose but weren't adopted until later in mass for a number of different reasons and there are lots of military stories of of where they like end up adopting a gun that's definitely not the best thing they could have adopted um i should also say there were a number of sort of corporate shenanigans um again i'm thinking about the the old west period where there would be a startup that was doing something that looked kind of interesting it looked like it might challenge the the you know, the established uh, popular brands like Winchester and uh, large companies like Winchester would more often than not buy up those companies and just shut them down. So perhaps a good answer to Brian's question would be something like the Burgess pump shotguns, which did get manufactured, um, but they end up being absorbed and sort of put out of business um, because a company like Winchester had a gun of their own that was competing with the Burgess and they wanted to just like they want to get rid of the competition and we could fight it by trying to make the best possible gun and improve what we've already got, or you know, we can just buy up the competitor and then shut down the production. And that's really a lot easier. Yeah. That said, well, the Burgess is than the other. some like the Burgess isn't really a better gun than, than the Winchesters. So it's, it's not the hundred mile per gallon secret carburetor that got scuttled, you know? What about modern, uh, day development because uh, you just put out a couple of videos on a new gun called the Alien that sort of seeks to upend mm. some of the conventions we see right now in modern handguns. Because if we're being honest, 
I think a lot of the modern handgun market, uh, the polymer, lower steel slide, browning, uh, you know, uh, action, uh, they're very similar to the initial Glock design from 30 years ago. There hasn't been, obviously there've been improvements to that and little things here or there. And, you know, you can make an argument for Smith & Wesson's got the best version or Glock or, or, or Springfield or whoever, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of game-changing design improvements in that time period. But you have a gun like the Alien come along uh, that you seem to be pretty excited about. Do you, do you think a gun like that is going to have a real impact on the movement of the modern handgun? Or, I mean, it starts at $4,000, right? It's sort of a, co a co competition gun. It, it doesn't have yes. enough advantages to change the market. At $4,000, absolutely not. At its current pricing, it will be a very niche item. Uh, for people who have the money to be able to drop on what is essentially a range toy. And I don't say that in a demeaning way. It's, you know, at that kind of price, most people aren't going to be willing to put the thing in any place where it might risk getting scratched or, or damaged in some way. Um, I have hopes that some of the elements in the alien will impact the larger market. In particular, I think the the development of optical sights that are durable enough and small enough to fit on handguns. I think that's a trend that is, it's not going away and it will already, we're seeing you know, in the last five or 10 years, more and more ready adoption of optics on handguns. And the Browning oh, yeah. slide is not really well suited to optics on handguns because that optic is slamming back and forth with every shot. And one of the things that the alien does is it has a, a fixed top strap on the pistol where the sights, either an optic or iron sights, are mounted so that they do not move when the pistol is cycling. That's a feature that I think, I hope, um, seems pretty obvious to me that that ought to be replicated in other new designs. Now, the downside to that is you cannot do it with a browning tilting barrel slide based pistol. Um, and we've gotten the thing is we've gotten really good at that browning system. Uh, people have been refining that as that basic design for 100 years now, 110 years now. Uh, and so they've gotten very efficient to manufacture. They've gotten very reliable variety of cartridges. And that makes them appealing. Like the best quality item is not necessarily the one that will succeed in the long term, because you also have to balance in uh, things like cost. So with Laugo, they're a small startup company. And they're Obviously, they have to charge a what is basically, by any other standard, a ridiculous price in order to to meet the basic overhead of we're a small brand new company trying to, you know, we don't have revenue from other sources to support the R and D and the development of this pistol. Now we've seen uh, FK Bruno come out with a pistol that a lot of people are comparing to the Alien because it was also it was I think seven thousand dollars when it came out. Um, it is technologically not nearly as interesting of a gun. Uh, although it's worth pointing out that there's nothing fundamentally new. No single element of the alien is brand new. We've had pistols that have fixed top straps. We have pistols that have gas delay uh, mechanisms. We have pistols that have uh, top mounted hammers. But Laugo has put those together in a combination that is really good. Uh, and that's how all firearms design is done today. They're virtually, there's basically nothing actually brand new. It's just different combinations of existing uh, ideas and systems. At any rate, FK Bruno took their $7,000 pistol and used the money from that initial price point. As far as I can tell, I don't have any direct insight into the company, but they used that to finance a polymer frame version of it and get some economy of scale going. And they were able to drop the price of the pistol to something like $1,500, I think. If Laugo is in a position to be able to do that as well, then I think we may see much more widespread adoption of of their guns, but maybe they'll remain as a boutique, high end, low volume manufacturer. I, I really don't know. Um, I don't like to try and predict that thing because every once in a while I do try to predict it, and it doesn't always work out the way I thought it would. <laughs> Pointing to my Hudsons up there, which I bought two Hudsons for the price of one because they went out of business, and the pistols all got blown out really cheap.